right, I'm so glad that you came back to listen to chapter 19. Our challenge today is to make a pillow and blanket fort somewhere in your house or in your room or your apartment. I am personally in my bedroom. I have my whole comforter pulled off my bed and I am all snuggly and cozy in here with Cece and Tucker. Kyle thinks I've gone a little bit crazy, but he doesn't understand because we are only two more chapters left until the City of Emperor is over. So I'm just going to cut right to the chase. Let's go on to chapter 19. Chapter 19. A World of Light. As they squeezed past the rocks at the entrance to the path, Dune thought he saw the candlelight glance off a shiny place on the wall. He stopped to look, and when he saw what it was, he called out to Lena, who was a few steps ahead of him. There's a notice! It was a framed sign, bolted to the stone, a printed sheet behind a piece of glass. Dampness had seeped under the glass and made splotches on the paper, but by holding their candles up close, they could read it. Welcome, refugees from Ember. This is the final stage of your journey. Be prepared for a climb that will take several hours. Fill your bottles with water from the river. We wish you good fortune. The Builders. They're expecting us, said Lena. Well, they wrote this a long time ago, Dune said. The people who put it here must all be dead by now. That's true, but they wished us good fortune. It makes me feel as if they're watching over us. Yes, and maybe their great-great-grandchildren will be there to welcome us. Encouraged, they started up the path. Their candles made only a feeble glow, but they could tell that the path was quite wide. The ceiling was high over their heads. The path seemed to have been made for a great company of people. In some places, the ground beneath their feet was rutted in parallel grooves, as if a wheeled cart of some kind had been driven over it. After they had walked a while, they realized that they were moving in long zigzags. The path would go in one direction for some time, and then turn sharply and go the opposite way. As they went along, they talked less and less. The path sloped relentlessly upward, and they needed their breath just for breathing. The only sound was the light pat-pat of their footsteps. Lena and Dune took turns carrying Poppy on their backs. She had gotten tired of walking very soon and cried to be picked up. Twice they stopped and sat down to rest, leaning against the walls of the passage and taking drinks from Dune's bottle of water. "'How many hours do you think we've been walking?' Lena asked. "'I don't know,' Dune said. "'Maybe two, maybe three. We must nearly be there. They climbed on and on. Their first candles had long ago burned down to the last inch, as had their second candles. Finally, when their third ones were about halfway gone, Lena began to notice that the air smelled different. The cold, sharp-edged rock smell of the tunnel was changing to something softer, a strange, lovely smell. As they rounded a corner, a gust of this soft air swept past them, and their candles went out. Dune said, I'll find a match, but Lena said, No, wait, look. They were not in complete darkness. A faint haze of light shone in the passage ahead of them. It's the lights of the city, breathed Lena. Lena set Poppy down. Quick, Poppy, she said, and Poppy began to trot keeping close at Lena's heels. The strange, lovely smell in the air grew stronger. The passage came to an end a few yards along now, and before them was an opening like a great empty doorway. Without a word, Lena and Dune took hold of each other's hands, and Lena took hold of Poppy's. When they stood in the doorway and looked out, they saw no new city at all, but something infinitely stranger. A land vast and spacious beyond any of their dreams, filled with air that seemed to move and lit by a shining silver circle hanging in an immense black sky. In front of their feet, the ground swept away in a long, gentle slope. It was not bare stone as an ember. Something soft covered it, like silvery hair, as high as their knees. 
Down the slope was a tumble of dark, rounded shapes, and then another slope rose beyond that. Way off into the distance, as far as they could see, the land lay in rolling swells, with clumps of shadow in the low places between them. Dune, cried Galena, more lights! She pointed at the sky. He looked up and saw them, hundreds and hundreds of tiny flecks of light, strewn like spilled salts across the blackness. Oh, he whispered. There was nothing else to say. The beauty of these lights made his breath stop in his throat. They took a few steps forward. Dune bent to feel the strands that grew out of the ground, almost higher than Poppy's head. They were cool and smooth and soft, and there was dampness on them. Breathe, said Lena. She opened her mouth and took a long breath of air. Dune did the same. It's sweet, he said, so full of smells. They held their hands out to feel the long stems as they waded slowly through them. The air moved against their faces and in their hair. Hear those sounds, said Dune. A high, thin, chirping sound came from somewhere nearby. It was repeated over and over like a question. Yes, said Lena. What could it be? Something alive, I think. Maybe some kind of bug. A bug that sings. Lena turned to Dune. Her face was shadowy in the silver light. It's so strange here, Dune, and so huge, but I'm not afraid. No, I'm not either. It feels like a dream. A dream, yes. Maybe that's why it feels familiar. I might have dreamed about this place. They walked until they came to where the dark shapes billowed up from the ground. These were plants, they discovered, taller than they were, with stems as hard and thick as the walls of houses, and leaves that spread out over their heads. On the slope beside these plants, they sat down. Do you think there's a city here somewhere? Lena asked. Or any people at all? I don't see any lights, Dune said, even far off. But with this silver lamp in the sky, maybe they don't need lights. Dune shook his head doubtfully. People would need more light than this, he said. How could you see well enough to work? How could you grow your food? It's a beautiful light, but not bright enough to live by. Then what shall we do? If there's no city and no people. I don't know. I don't know. Dune didn't feel like thinking. He was tired of figuring things out. He wanted to look at this new world and take in the scent of it and the feel of it and figure things out later. Lena felt the same way. She stopped asking questions, drew Poppy into her lap, and gazed in silence at the glimmering landscape. After a while, she became aware that something strange was happening. Surely when she had first sat down, the silver, silver circle was just above the highest branch of a tall plant. Now the branch cut against it. As she watched, the circle sank very slowly down, until it was hidden, except for a gleam of brightness beneath the leaves. It's moving, she said to Dune. Yes. A little later, it seemed to her that her eyes were blurring. There was a fuzziness in the sky especially around the edges. It took a while for her to realize what was making the fuzziness. Light, she said. I see it, said Dune. It's getting brighter. The edge of the sky turned gray and then pale orange and then deep fiery crimson. The land stood out against it, a long black rolling line. One spot along this line grew so bright they could hardly look at it. So bright it seemed to take a bite out of the land. It rose higher and higher until they could see that it was a fiery circle. First deep orange and then yellow, and too bright to look at any longer. The color seeped out of the sky and washed over the land. Light sparkled on the soft hair of the hills and shone through the lacy leaves as every shade of green sprang to life around them. They lifted their faces to the astonishing warmth. The sky arched over them, higher than they could even imagine, a pale, clear blue. Lena felt as though a lid that had been on her all her life had been lifted off. 
Light and air rushed through her, making a song, like the songs of ember, only it was a song of joy. She looked at Dune and saw that he was smiling and crying at the same time, and she realized that she was, too. Everything around them was springing to life. A glorious racket came from the branches, tweedling notes, peeps, burbles, high, sharp calls. Bugs? wondered Dune, imagining with awe the bugs that could make such sounds. But then he saw something fly from a cluster of leaves and swoop down low across the ground, making a clear, sweet call as it flew. Did you see that? he said to Lena, pointing. And there's another one. And there! There, 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 repeated Poppy, leaping from Lena's lap and whirling around, pointing in every direction. The air was full of them now. They were much too large to be insects. One of them lit nearby on a stem. It looked as if though they had two black eyes and opening its mouth, which was pointed like a thorn, sent forth a little trill. It's speaking to us, said Doom. What could it be? Lena just shook her head. The little creature shifted its claw-like feet on the stem, flapped its brown wings, and trailed again. Then it leapt into the air and was gone. They leapt up too and threw themselves into exploration. The ground was alive with insects, so many that Dune just laughed, laughed in helpless wonder. Flowers bloomed among the green blades, and a stream ran at the foot of the hill. They roamed over the green-coated slopes, running, sliding, calling out to each other with each new discovery, until they were exhausted. Then they sat down by the entrance to the path to eat what was left of their food. They untied Dune's bundle, and Lena suddenly cried out, The book! We forgot about the book! There it was, wrapped in its blotched green cloth. Let's read it out loud while we eat, said Dune. Lena opened the fragile notebook and laid it on the ground in front of her. She picked up a carrot with one hand, and with the other she kept her place on the scribbled page. This is what she read. And that's the end of chapter 19, guys. So, so beautiful. I just, it's just overwhelming to try and see the world from Lena and Dune's eyes. They walked into the world, which we can assume at night, right? This silver silver circle in the sky must have been the moon and the other lights were the stars. And, you know, they discovered grass. They discovered trees for the first time. They discovered birds for the first time. They discovered a sunrise and a sunset uh, um, with the sun and the high in the sky. And, I mean, they're just so overwhelmed by this new world. Um, and I'm so excited to see what this notebook says because I don't know about y'all, but I do have one last question, which is why was there a city of ember why was there this city that had like was run underground or or like in a shelter with no sun and only you know the river to use for energy i have so many questions what made them have what made the builders have to build the city of ember so hopefully um our answers will be given to us in the very last chapter, chapter 20. Um, But I don't know about you all. I'm going to hang out in my fort for a little bit longer and just try and think of what it would be like to be Lena, Dune, and Poppy to find the world that we know um, and never, and not have any words to describe it. So I am so excited to end the book with y'all. I'm going to go right on to chapter 20 and see what happens. Um, But I hope you come with me nights. I'll see you there.